14 minutes. It's uh, not a lot of time to talk about Haiti, so we'll get right into it. January 12, 2010, 445 in the evening. Does anyone remember where they were? I remember exactly where I was. The world almost came to an end for many people in Haiti. For about 84 seconds, the ground shook as a 7.3 magnitude quake rocked their nation's capital of Port-au-Prince. 445 is a very important time. In 84 seconds, 300,000 people died. They were crushed under these buildings that came down. If that earthquake had occurred 42 minutes later, after 5.30, when businesses were closed and people were out on the street waiting for little jitney buses to take them home, that death toll cuts in half. If that earthquake occurs 12 hours later at 5 a.m., when people are in their shanty towns, in their homes, in not well-structured buildings, like those buildings downtown, the death toll is about a quarter. So 300,000 people die, or 225,000 excess people die, because of the time of day in which that earthquake occurred. Now you think about a country like Haiti, you know, you think about the coups, the Tonton Macou, baby Doc Duvalier, his kid, you know, his dad, Papa Doc. This is a country that could not take an earthquake. This is the one country in the world, the one place in the world that just did not have the infrastructure to begin with, let alone to withstand this type of quake. So let's forget about the 300,000 that died, and let's think about the 300,000, the 297,000, I should say, people that were injured and laying there. The medical infrastructure in Haiti, on its best day, is limited. The medical infrastructure on Haiti, on January 13th, after that quake, was decimated. Could you imagine 300,000 patients rolling into the 17 emergency rooms in that greater area? It would overwhelm it. This is what we did at Global Medic, and as you, some of you don't know who we are. We're basically a, a Canadian-based charity. We're based here in Toronto, and we're a group of emergency workers. Many of us are Humber grads, including myself. We're paramedics, we're police officers, we're firefighters, we're folks that, you know, you call, when you call 911, we respond to your emergency. So when grandma's having her heart attack, or, you know, dad slipped while shoveling the snow and broken his hip, we're the people you call. We, we're the ones you call to come control your chaotic situation. Well, many of us volunteer, we give up our time to go out with global medic teams during another nation's time of disaster. And uh, when that quake came into Haiti, we knew we'd be responding. That night, not a single radio station was working. Not a single television station was working. There was no broadcast of what was happening in that country. The Americans, um, you know, scrambled their fighter jets and AWACS planes over the nation's capital, and it was dark. There was absolutely no lights on in a city of three million. Sorry, in a city of one million, can you imagine? No lights, no, nothing on. If that doesn't tell you how bad a disaster is going to be, nothing will prepare you for it. You realize right then and there that this is going to be the worst. And in the morning when those AWACS planes were circling and uh, other planes came in lower, they realized how bad that damage was. And the Americans took action right away, right? They sent in their Marines. They took over that airport. They tried to clear off the planes and from that runway and get that runway open to start landing troops in in order to set up bases in order to get aid into that country. What we did at Global Medic was we went out into the Dominican Republic. We realized we weren't going to get into that Port-au-Prince airport, so we flew into the Dominican Republic and then took the long way overland in convoys to the Haitian borders. And you got to understand, Haiti has peacekeeping troops in it. And those peacekeeping troops from six different countries have made a concerted effort to round up some of the worst bad guys in the world. People with guns, people that are from criminal gangs, and they rounded them up and put them into a prison. And once they put them into this prison, the earthquake took it right down. And when the earthquake took it down, 3,000 of the country's most violent offenders took to the street. How hard do you think it is to get a gun in Haiti? So at nighttime, there was no such thing as control or security, which means Haiti was really two countries, one during the day and one at night. When we arrived in Haiti, we purposely drove overnight to get to the border first thing in the morning because we knew we could do nothing at night. We didn't have control, we didn't have security, and there was not a thing we could do to help people when darkness fell. When we got to the gates, I remember the convoy we were in. We had this nine-car convoy. There was journalists in the middle of it. There was other aid groups. There was our trucks. There were our vans. There were our buses. We had to put all of the aid inside the buses because we didn't want people jumping on top and looting it. You know how desperate people are when they have absolutely nothing and then they see this aid convoy coming in 
It's human nature. They're just going to get on the back of your convoy and take the aid that you have because they really need it. And I'm thinking to myself, is this really that bad? And I remember getting up to the gate that divides Dominican Republic and Haiti, and the road ends, like that paved road's done. Once you cross into Haiti, that, that road's nothing. That's how you know you're there. And I remember getting out in full tactical gear with a stack of passports for all our team and walking up to the guy at the gate, thinking game face, get your game face on, get, get through this you know, barrier right away. And the guy just stopped waving at me. And I'm thinking, oh, what are we going to do? Are we going to waste time and wait at this gate? Absolutely the opposite. He looked at us and he realized we were one of the few rescue teams on their way in as everybody was flooding out of Haiti. And he opened the doors without even checking our passport. So the first time I went into Haiti, 60 hours or 58 hours after that quake, there's no record I was there on my passport. Can you imagine? That's how bad the nation was. And we were driving in this convoy, so worried about getting robbed and looted and uh, getting to our destination, that we started noticing things like the houses. Maybe one house would be down out of 10. And we thought, oh, it's not so bad. And as we got closer into the city, it was two or three that were down soon. It was only one house or one building standing, and the other nine are down. And then you realize that, yes, this is the worst it's ever been. And the people, I remember passing them, because this was the news that was coming back home. My wife would tell me this is what she saw on the news at night. And I remember seeing it on the way by, but not realizing that that's what Canadians were talking about. The bodies being piled up in front of the UN. The noise, the screaming, the sheer chaos. We could have stopped our convoy at any point on that way. We could have stopped our convoy, we could have gotten out, we could have handed out our aid, we could have set up our water units, and we would have saved the masses at any point. Now, of course, we can't do that. We're there in a coordinated effort. We're going to one specific spot to help one specific region, because that's what we told the authorities where we're going to be. So they don't send more aid to that one spot, and they try and distribute the aid so that everybody in that room gets the help. Just like if all of us in this room we're part of a disaster, it's not good to just give aid to the front corner. We've got to get it out to everyone, right? We finally made it to Carrefour, which is just a little suburb, 17 kilometers southwest of the capital. It's, it's a suburb. It's what Mississauga is to Toronto. You know, it's a big area within an urban, you know, urban core of a city. And I remember jumping down on the bus and telling our medical team to hit the ground running. Let's get out there and treat patients. And about 18 minutes after we were on the ground and in this hospital, our surgeon took off his first leg. 400 would follow. And those medical teams would work day and night, and they would treat 7,000 people, 400 of which are surgical cases. Now, you can imagine the sheer horror of people laying in a hospital, but not inside the hospital because the building's unsafe, laying on the front grounds of this hospital in the, in the lawn. If they were lucky, they were on a piece of plywood. And their families would chase after everyone to just try and get them some assistance. We ran out of pain control in about six hours. Can you imagine? Can you imagine taking off a young girl's leg without pain control? What an awful thought, what an awful memory that is. While our medical team was doing that, I stepped out with one of our water engineers onto a, a campus, the Adventist, Develop the Adventist uh, University, you know, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. They have a university, and that campus turned into a refugee camp. It just turned into an instant camp overnight where you'd get anywhere between 26,000 people taking refuge every day. And at night, it would swell. And we found a pool, and we set up this water system. And I remember all that noise, all the noise in the background, of just the people clamoring, the chaos. And I remember setting up the water system with another Humber grad. And for about five minutes, there was no noise because we were in that zone. We had something that was going to save the masses, and we were in that zone of where we were installing it, and we had the solution. And I remember the hiccup in the road. We ran out of motor oil, and one of the kids goes running up the road and smashes the window. Half the country's destroyed. Who cares if you break another window, right? And taking a bottle of oil, leaving some money for it, and uh, putting the oil back in the generator, and then the machine is running. The water's running clean test it, and it works. We high-five each other, and then the noise came back in as I turned, and behind me is a kilometer-long lineup of people that are thirsty, dying for clean water. And you think you've won that day because you managed to deliver 26,000 people clean drinking water. But that's just it. It's getting together. It's just starting. That entire mission is just 
starting. It's not those 26,000. It's the next 50,000 that you've got to help. So that machine would run, and every single day we would go out and help others and get more machines installed, little tiny portable machines. Now, while we're working, against those medics are working and the water engineers are working, we did a Hail Mary football term. You know, we had this last-minute, last-ditch idea that we thought would work. And I, I tell you, if I explain it to you, you'd think I was crazy. We saw all these neighborhoods that had absolutely no water, and you couldn't get water to them, and people were hurt. They couldn't get out of their neighborhood. They couldn't hike up. There was not enough water for them. And we thought, what if we took a portable water unit and put it on a motorcycle and took a kid and put him down there so that we would get them clean water? Isn't that crazy? People would loot. They would steal. We thought, let's just try this. Let's take a kid from that neighborhood. And that's what we did. We just took kids, volunteers from that neighborhood. They got on these motorcycles. They went down there. The pipes were broken. They'd fill these 100-gallon drums up with water throw the machines into them and start handing out water, and the masses came running. And the kids would say, look, I'm going to be here every day. And the kid would say, I played soccer with your son. I remember you. You were my librarian. I remember you, ma'am. You were my teacher. Because the kids were empowered and they were from that neighborhood, they were able to deliver hope, hope in the form of clean water and water security to those folks. So instead of having mass chaos, it was quite the opposite. People were jovial. They were happy. They knew they were getting clean water. So that Hail Mary turned in from one motorcycle and two machines to 64 units. And before you knew it, we were getting a million liters of water out to starving Haitians and thirsty Haitians every single week. And after about 14, 15 weeks, when we were at the 15 million liter mark, we found a local agency that agreed to take over the entire program and pay these kids and keep running it. So for this next six months, they would keep getting water. And if you think about the impact, it's huge. A million liters of water a week there. You take that away, cholera comes a lot earlier. More death, more destruction comes earlier. All those patients in the hospital, doesn't matter how many times you treat them, they're going to go home, they're going to get sick because they don't have clean water. They're going to come right back to you. All those newborns you delivered, are they going to survive? What I remember most about Haiti is two things. I remember the heroes many of them from this school that took their time, that left their jobs. You know, heroes like Sean Large, a, a, a young man who works a, an ambulance in Brampton. And how he kept an eight-day-old infant alive while we were racing across town trying to get to an Israeli hospital to keep this child alive. Meanwhile, the child in my arms dies. Mostly I remember those young men that would volunteer, even though many of them had lost loved ones. Many of their loved ones were in our hospital having our surgeon remove limbs. But they would come out every single day because it was so important to them to be able to give their countrymen clean water to keep them alive. To me, those are the heroes. And when I hear phrases like, please, don't forget Haiti, that's what I remember the most of Haiti. And that's why I think Haiti, the tragedy of Haiti is we've forgotten. It's been 500 days. Haiti's not on the top of our mind. We don't think about it anymore. And yet, many of these people are still living in tents. The aid, the development, the billions of dollars, the promises haven't been delivered. And if you think about it, that quake could have happened to us. Those rescuers would still do the same thing. They would save people. It's improper for us to have forgotten these folks. So with my 14 minutes of fame here today with Ted, or TEDx, I want you to always remember Haiti. Don't forget them. They need our help still. Thank you.